असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय ओम शांति 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 नमस्ते एंड अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू फॉर हैविंग मी हियर सच अ जॉय टू बी हियर एट सीटन हॉल यूनिवर्सिटी एंड आई वॉज सो हैप्पी टू सी द कीन इंटरेस्ट हियर बाय द रिलीजियस स्टडीज डिपार्टमेंट एंड द रेगुलर स्टडी ऑफ द भगवद गीता इट्स सो वंडरफुल एंड वेल आई हैव नो वर्ड्स टू स्पीक अबाउट भगवद गीता आई एम टेलिंग यू बिकॉज इट इज सच अ डीप स्क्रिप्चर गिविंग अ सच अ वंडरफुल इंट्रोडक्शन टू द इनर स्परिचुअल लाइफ एंड द नेचर ऑफ ह्यूमन लाइफ ह्यूमन कॉन्शियसनेस द मीन्स टूवर्ड्स द हाइएस्ट गोल द हारमोनी ऑफ द योगास वॉट इज इट दैट यू डोंट फाइंड इन द भगवद गीता सो थैंक यू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस टॉपिक इट्स आफ्टर माई हार्ट बिकॉज आई रिमेंबर आई स्टडीड द भगवद गीता वेन आई वॉज वेरी यंग एंड आई जस्ट गॉट हुक टू इट एंड द स्टडी कंटिन्यूज इवन नाउ आई जस्ट कॉन्ट लीव द स्क्रिप्चर because it has such magnificent concentrated ideas on the spiritual life and the spiritual goal of life so it makes for a, a very elevating study uh but first before i go into bhagavad gita as the essence of the upanishads let me give you a uh, an introduction or let me at least give you the backdrop of the bhagavad gita initially to help us understand where exactly this conversation took place why did it take place and um well what was the special context of those times why were where these questions asked so the bhagavad gita you will find as part of the mahabharat and the bhishma parva of the mahabharat uh the the chapters from 25 to 42 of the bhishma parva uh you will find the bhagavad gita there but what is it about uh the story uh, you know it's a long story the mahabharat but let me condense it for you it's a very interesting story because um there are these two brothers pandu and dhritarashtra actually there were three brothers but let's concentrate on these two and the children of the of pandu were called the pandavas and the children of dhritarashtra were the kauravas the pandavas were 5 in number and the kauravas were 100 in number but uh, although they the fathers were brothers these children never got along with each other they were cousins uh, but the pandavas always stood for righteousness and dharma and uh, Kauravas always stood for unrighteousness and greed and uh, covetousness and uh, these kinds of things so these two uh, factions within the family were always at loggerheads with each other when the pandavas came to hastinapur and they also had their education there they grew up there uh, the kauravas did not like it and they wanted the kingdom all for themselves they wanted the sons of pandu to be out of hastinapur and when it was time for the pandavas to lay claim to the kingdom because the kingdom originally belonged to pandu and so rightfully belonged to the pandavas uh the eldest son of uh the kaurava family duryodhan would not allow it and in fact he proclaimed that they would not have space even uh that that much space which uh, the tip of a needle would occupy they have no place here so this led to the great war what we call the mahabharat and um the war was more a, a war for righteousness rather than a, a war for power or glory or land or kingdom because this is made very clear in the questions which arjun puts to krishna uh, which is the conversation of the bhagavad gita uh see there is a point in the war of uh, just before the war began when the third pandava whose name was arjun uh felt very very bad about what was happening and just before the war he asked to be taken in between the two armies of the pandavas and the kauravas so he wanted to view uh what was the kaurava army like and there he saw his own cousins cousin brothers he saw his grandsire 
he saw his gurus, his preceptors, and it pained him so much. And he said that, how can I, how can I kill them? That's my extended family. And I don't want the kingdom at this cost. I'm not that ambitious. None of us are. So it's okay. We will drop the whole matter and I don't want to fight. So then comes up the words of the Lord, Lord Krishna, where he tells him, look, this war has no personal basis. It is not being done for you or your brothers. It is being done to establish righteousness on this earth. So don't take a personal view of it. It is meant for Loka Sangraha, the welfare of the entire Bharatvarsh, because almost all the kings of North India were involved in the war, either on this side or on the other. So it is meant to establish righteousness here, and it is not meant to, uh, you know, just for your family or don't take it personally. In fact, renounce all personal attitudes because your very nature is the self which is the self of all beings. You are that, you are the Atman, O Arjuna. You are not this little personality, the third Pandava. You are not merely this. You are the Atman. And take that standpoint and do this war because Arjuna was a key player in the war. He was a, a master archer and he was, uh, they were relying completely on him to win the war. So Krishna had to tell him that uh, don't take do this war for personal reasons. It is not what it is meant for. So this entire illumining dialogue between the two uh, just before the war began is what we call the Bhagavad Gita. Now, this uh, particular dialogue has tremendous spiritual concepts and the entire understanding of life and consciousness and what the in human individual is about. What is the nature of the self? And how does it connect with everything around you, everyone around you? And so then what is the purpose of this core karma, this great war? And how should you take it? And why you should do it? This entire thing is discussed. I can't tell you the marvelous ideas in this uh, particular dialogue. I have uh, really dipped into the Bhagavad Gita for many years. And always I come back renewed and rejuvenated and refreshed in mind. Because ultimately it is telling you the nature of the soul and its destiny. And what karma or action is about. What the human personality is about. So it's a very deep dialogue. We will go into some of the essential, very important aspects of it. Uh, let me go a little bit into the history now. When did this particular episode occur? So the Mahabharat actually dates back to 5,000 years, 5,000 years back. And the exact date of the Bhagavad Gita is placed at 3139 BC by Indian scholars. So that's a very long time back. And um, what was the venue of this? It was the battlefield. It was Kurukshetra, where this dialogue took place. Kurukshetra is very close to Delhi, where I live. Even today, if you go there, um, you will see the particular spot marked where the Bhagavad Gita actually is supposed to have taken place. And the whole uh, battlefield, it was a battleground. Uh, the whole place is uh, sort of identified as the Kurukshetra battlefield. And this great war which involved most of North Indian kingdoms uh, was fought mainly for the purpose of not, not so that, uh, well, they are siding with one family or the other. They are, they are wanting to bring a certain amount of harmony and righteousness. That is why the entire battle was fought. So there's a lot of uh, talk and discussion about dharma in the entire Mahabharat. Uh, Kauravas party, the party of the Kauravas led by Duryodhan, was very unrighteous in their entire conduct, in their um, attitudes not just towards their cousin brothers, but towards everyone. And that is why, to put them down, the great battle was fought. And then I would like to go into uh, how big is the Bhagavad Gita. It, is, it, it consists of 700 verses. It's quite big. And um, it has 18 chapters. 
Now, how, how is this possible on a battlefield? You may ask this question. Such a long uh, poem or, or discussion. Uh, it is said that uh, Krishna, and this is part of the Mahabharata story, stalled time, stopped time to converse with Arjuna. And once the uh, Arjun was convinced of his duty, his dharma in that particular uh, context, then again times began. So the Almighty Lord has the power to handle time, space and causation, isn't it? All the essential parameters of life and manifestation. So they are in his hands. So this is how it is described, the Mahabharata, uh, I mean the Bhagavad Gita. And the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita is, it is the essence of the Upanishadic thought. Now you may ask, what are the Upanishads? See, all of us have heard of the word Vedas. They are the most ancient manuscripts available to humankind. And they are compendiums of knowledge, consisting of Sanskrit mantras for sacrifice, describing the nature of existential reality, what was called Parabrahman, describing the nature of life and the human personality, and a mantras for a whole lot of sacrifices, uh, what we call yagnyas in those days. So all these, are, these compendiums of knowledge are four in number, the Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, uh, Sama Ved and Atharva Ved. But the most important part of these Vedas are the knowledge portion of the Vedas, which actually consists of ideas, concentrated ideas on the nature of existential reality, the nature of our primary existence, human consciousness, and what human life and destiny are about. So these intense discussions cannot be uh, relegated to uh, sacrificial mantras. So they were considered to be the knowledge portion or what we call the Upanishads. And these have been extensively studied. This literature has been brought out separately because it essentially is what we call Vedanta today. The very definition of Vedanta is Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam. The evidence provided by the Upanishadic texts towards the nature of reality as it is, is Vedanta. So this is the most important part of the Vedic literature. It's a, it's a complete philosophy in itself. And many streams are, and branches of philosophy have emerged from the Upanishadic thought. Now, amongst the Hindus, we, we consider the Bhagavad Gita to be the very essence of the Upanishads. The Upanishads are the essence of the Vedas, but the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Upanishads. It holds in it the key ideas which the Upanishads give us. And it also gives us the means to them. The means to the understanding and realization of Upanishadic thought. So this is described in the Bhagavad Gita itself in a very beautiful verse. Uh, in the introductory verses of the Bhagavad Gita, you have this verse uh, that um, Sarvo Upanishado Gavo Dogdha Gopalanandana Partho Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta Dugdham Gita Amritam Mahat which means Sarvo Upanishado Gavo if you consider all the Upanishads to be like cows then Dogdha Gopalanandana the, the milker of those cows is Lord Krishna himself and the one who drinks that milk one who has that uh, milk are Arjun and all of us who are interested in the nectar of the Bhagavad Gita and the milk is the Bhagavad Gita itself. <laughs> so this is how it is described. Every chapter of the Bhagavad Gita ends with, like for example, if you take the second chapter, the Sankhya Yoga, it ends with Atha Dvitiyodhyayaha Sankhya Yoga and then it is a Yoga Brahma Vidya, it is a Yoga Shastra. This is how it ends. This kind of description is there. So, the Gita itself is describing its content. It is a Brahma Vidya. What does this mean? It is penetrating into the nature of ultimate reality, the nature of Brahman. That is the purpose of the text. Through this conversation, it's a penetration into the nature of pure consciousness, Brahman. And it is a Yoga Shastra, which means it gives you the means towards that end. It gives you the yoga 
the the means to reach this existential reality so you see the bhagavad gita is a is a very you can say a complete scripture which is giving you the means and the end together and since it is such an ancient scripture you will find a lot of commentaries on the bhagavad gita lot of masterly commentaries in fact we approach the bhagavad gita through the commentaries you even if you read it just like that it's exhilarating it's it's just takes you out of this world <laughs> but uh if you go into the commentaries you get numerous ideas about many things you have shankar bhashya on uh, bhagavad gita shridhar bhashya uh, madhusudan saraswati's work so many commentaries in fact all the leading acharyas of the different systems of indian philosophical thought have written their commentary on the bhagavad gita and even in modern times you have uh, bal gangadhar tilak's commentary so many of modern thinkers philosophers all of them have commented on the bhagavad gita and it is the source of inspiration for a whole lot of thinkers in the modern world in fact it is uh, it is like nectar to read the bhagavad gita you will not find a single idea out of context out of spiritual understanding everything is just concentrated spirituality in this dialogue and it's a 700 verse <laughs> documentation so it's a huge um, poem you can say and it is the bhagavad gita the words of the lord krishna not bhagavad gita it is not about the lord it is of the lord it's the, it consists of veritably the words of krishna so it is a very very important scripture there's no doubt about that then the bhagavad gita forms part of the prasthana tray which means the three pillars of hindu thought hindu philosophical thought they have been identified to be the upanishads the bhagavad gita and the brahma sutras the upanishads i told you what they are it's vedant and bra bhagavad gita is the essence of the upanishads in a sense and the brahma sutras are the logical support or evidence to the upanishadic thought the sutras created by badrayan are called the brahma sutras so these three together uh, constitute the the pillar of hindu philosophical thinking prasthana tray and then when was the bhagavad gita first translated the original is in sanskrit but it's easy sanskrit you know anyone who is uh, well versed with sanskrit will find a lot of meaning in those words you just have to know the sandhi you must be able to split the words properly and you'll get a lot of meaning out of it but for those who don't know the original uh, sanskrit uh, it was translated into english i think it was the first scripture hindu scripture which was translated into english in 1785 by sir charles wilkins because you know the first governor general of india warren hastings the british governor general of india was a gita enthusiast so he had it translated and throughout his life he was dedicated to the bhagavad gita in fact he said long after the british empire uh, goes out of india generations will continue to be inspired by the thought of the bhagavad gita he mentioned this and today really bhagavad gita lives in our uh, very veins and blood and it's like the bible of the hindus of all denominations deeply studied the bhagavad uh, gita is studied in various ways in india uh, one way is to go into the original scripture and discuss it that is one way the second way is you learn the chanting over a period of time and there are bhagavad gita chanting competitions all over especially in the south india you will find a lot of these things going on and another way is uh, to have regular seminars on the thought philosophical thought of the bhagavad gita it has even come into universities not just in philosophy departments but uh, of course philosophy and religion religious studies will have this but also in the science of consciousness you have the study of the bhagavad gita so uh, a lot of activity and i would say uh, mental churning is going on on this and if uh, you want to know how many people have been inspired by the scripture i can tell you that um, starting from the american transcendentalists emerson thoreau walt whitman and going to the uh, german romantics to the british orientals almost everyone was inspired by the bhagavad gita 
and in india almost every great thinker philosopher nationalist was inspired by the bhagavad gita gandhi vivekananda rajgopalachari bal gangadhar tilak all our national leaders we take this as a scripture as um, par excellence um, the bhagavad gita is worshiped everywhere but most importantly it it requires to be read and practiced <laughs> so this is the um, introduction i would like to give to the bhagavad gita and let us go a bit into the subject matter before i start uh, the powerpoint presentation on the very important aspects of the bhagavad gita what is there in the bhagavad gita which has such wide appeal see first of all um the bhagavad gita is very very inclusive there's nothing exclusive about it it is the science of consciousness and the technology of consciousness that it speaks of so it has mass appeal in the sense it appeals to anyone anywhere uh, as uh, he just said in the introduction uh, there is nothing that can uh, uh, that you can say uh, the bhagavad gita belongs to hindu thought there's nothing in it like that it is the study of the human soul the nature of human consciousness and the means to unravel or unfold human consciousness and the nature of meditation that is a wonderful chapter the dhyana yoga in the bhagavad gita the nature of devotion bhakti yoga you have and then the importance of karma action and the effects of action what action leads to what are the consequences of action extensive discussions on these then you have a whole lot of mind management techniques so important to the modern world yes a whole lot of discussion on the nature of the mind how to control it how to bring it into your hands because you know arjun is an accomplished warrior he has questions like any one of us or uh, who are accomplished in various fields of life so he asked the question how do i control this mind which is like the wind and then the answers to that and the nature of the mind the that is why the importance of fundamental qualities like detachment inner freedom the meditative awareness all this has been extensively dwelt upon then you have the triguna theory uh, being uh, propounded there Uh, which means what is why are we different mentally why do we have a uh, different attitudes and what is the nature of the sattva rajas and tamasic minds so how it determines our attitudes how it determines our emotion and our behaviors so a lot of behavioral psychology will find there a lot of relationship psychology will find there <laughs> so it's a it's a huge compendium of a uh, very great knowledge this is what i would tell you it is inexhaustible i don't know how much i can tell you about the bhagavad gita but there are a whole lot of magnificent ideas there you can draw from any chapter and he never goes into any other topic you know that's the beauty of the gita he never talks of anything other than the intense spiritual life the awakened consciousness so you will find all of this in the bhagavad gita now let me show you a few slides before uh, we discuss some very important points um you see this is the introduction to the prasthana tray and the mantra which i told you about which describes bhagavad gita as the essence of the upanishads sarva upanishado gavo dogdha gopala nandana partho vatsa sudhir bhokta dugdham gita amrita mahat and then it contains the essence of all upanishads and pathways for practical application it dwells on the fundamentals of existence and describes the integration of yogas thus it becomes uh, it's revered like the bible of the hindus and irrespective of their denominations and you find the prasthana tray uh, described there the upanishads which is the upadesha prasthan or injunctive text the bhagavad gita is considered the sadhana prasthan or the practical text and the bhagavad gita is the sutra prasthan or formulative text or uh, you can say the mm, logical support for upanishadic thought so these constitute the three pillars of uh, hindu philosophical thinking 
Then we have the setting of the Bhagavad Gita which I already described to you. The great war of Mahabharat fought between the Pandavas and Kauravas uh, in 3139 BC, about 5000 years back. And this is the timeline according to Indian scholars Aryabhata and others. And then it is the in an integral part of Mahabharat, the Bhishma Parva between chapters 25 to 42. First translated into English in 1785 by Charles Wilkins. It was called the Wilkins Gita and deeply influenced many, including Emerson, Aldous Huxley, uh, Thoreau, Jung, Gandhi, Vivekananda, etc., etc. Many people. Now, the emphasis in the Bhagavad Gita is on karma and karma yoga because, you know, the, um, the Bhagavad Gita was given out at a point just before a great war was being fought. See, it didn't arise in some Himalayan cave where you were con contemplating on eternal verities. No, it was given out on the eve, uh, I mean, just before a war was fought. So the, the entire, you know, philosophy there is go ahead and do your duty no matter what. And don't keep any personal ground for fulfilling your duties. In a sense, do your duty impersonally. Stand on your impersonal true nature as pure consciousness, as the Atman, and then go ahead and do what you ought to do, what is required of you to do for the welfare of everyone. So this is urged in so many ways in the Bhagavad Gita because, you know, the natural doubt of Arjun was this. Why should I fight? They are my own people. Why should I kill them? Then the answer is, no, 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 in this context, they are not your own people. You are fighting the battle for righteousness, to bring peace and harmony into the world. And that is why karma neva adhikaraste ma faleshu kadachana. You have only right to the action. You don't have the right to the fruits thereof, to the consequence of the action. Whether you win the war or you lose the war or whatever happens, you don't have a right over that. You, you're not supposed to think of that. Think only of your duty in the present context. See, this applies in every context of our life, of our lives. Please see. When you are you have an examination, we are in Seton Hall University. When you have an examination ahead of you, if you think, oh, will I pass? Will I fail? Will this happen? Will I get a job here? What will my parents say? What will this? Then you can't actually concentrate on what you have to do. Karma Nevadhikaras, they just concentrate on what you have to do today. This is so very important. So this is what is being told here. You see the principle of karma yoga. Karma neva dhikaraste ma faleshu kadachana. Don't think of the results of the fruits. Concentrate your entire vital energy on the work on ha in hand. And ma karma falahe turbu ma te sangostva karmani. Which means let not attachment in any form nor inaction come into you. Just concentrate on the action to be performed and forget about the results and what will come out of it. And never resort to any form of attachment which Arjun was having at that point of time. Yes. And never resort to inaction. Which means the human energy in our system is meant for a particular goal. So this clarity if it comes into our minds that my purpose is only to attain, do the action in front of me, do my duties, that's all. And not to think too much. See, our problem is overthinking, isn't it? Hmm? <laughs> the overflow of thought makes us forget this. And the strong attachments and fears which we have make us forget this. Isn't this true? Hmm? So that is why this very important uh, shlok in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, this has been you know, the inspiration of so many of our nationalist leaders, uh, so many people around the world that at the point of action, even when you have to make a decision, how should you be? Put down your thought process, which is constantly thinking of the pros and cons. Put it down. Just concentrate on your duty, what I ought to do and in this particular situation. And shake off your attachments, shake off the... Uh, this 
laziness or whatever uh, gives puts you into inaction shake it off and just concentrate on the action and the beautiful philosophy there is you see when a soldier kills another soldier we give him a medal for winning the battle but if a common man kills somebody on the street it's considered murder the act is the same what is the difference duty isn't it isn't the act the same hmm? anybody click anybody on the street uh, you will it's murder you'll be put into jail but a soldier killing a soldier and he is awarded for it on the frontier he's awarded why you are defending the borders for your people for the nation it's a selfless act of service you're putting your life at risk to defend the country so the same act becomes a yoga if it has a different motive or intention that is the same it's killing so this key point has to be understood even in the context of the bhagavad gita in our own lives you see how applicable all this is if the motive behind your action is very clean very unselfish selfless that very action becomes a yoga it changes the entire karma fall you know it changes the fruit of the action completely and it will be applauded it's a laudable act because you did it not for personal gains not for the selfish gene <laughs> you did it with a bigger purpose you saw the big picture and you did it so you see even an act like killing can become a yoga if it is done with this this thing in behind you so th this is the actual philosophy of the bhagavad gita why is arjun being urged to fight for this reason so the philosophy of the karma yoga is very deep any action yields fruit according to the motives behind the action and if the motive is not good you may be doing a very nice action but there's no real good motive behind it it will fail in its effect this is a psychological law please see <laughs> being described this way in the bhagavad gita so uh, our actions more important than our actions are the motives behind our action the intention the will what is it oriented towards that is going to decide the consequences of the action the fruit of the action so this is a, a important slide the main theme of uh, bhagavad gita was karma yoga the right attitude towards the action you perform because arjun was in a very crucial uh, phase you know passing through a deep indecisiveness and uh, that's why the first yoga of the bhagavad gita was the arjun vishad yoga uh, which means where arjuna is full of sorrow and crying and has all the symptoms of high bp you know <laughs> he's sweating and heart rate has increased all this is going on because i can't i can't imagine killing he puts it like this i can't imagine killing uh, my own people but the actual fact is your attachments the actual fact is at this point you are not able to take a decision so that is why karma yoga but you know uh, lord krishna gives karma yoga after sankhya yoga which is very interesting because sankhya yoga is about your real nature it's the yoga of knowledge so he he takes him to his real nature gives him the ideas that you are the atman you are the self functioning through body and mind so your personality is secondary and your personal relationships are also tertiary so don't base your philosophy of action on tertiary principles focus on the main thing the main thing is you have to establish righteousness in this world because you are a kshatriya prince this is your duty this is your dharma so you are fighting the war and not to for my family or for my relationships not for that so you see it's a very deep philosophy at that point you know anybody would have reacted like arjun and so this lesson is very important to understand in the bhagavad gita it's a lesson for all of us do your duty without uh 
considering anything else at the point of action do your duty and duty is a very important word which means what is the right thing to do what i ought to do in that condition and without attachment so you see after sankhya yoga comes karma yoga and then this is imparted in such a big way it's a huge chapter and it inspires arjuna finally towards uh, going into the war and then he finally wins the war then the another great idea of the bhagavad gita is you know you worship through your own work you worship the supreme lord through your own work yata pravrittir bhutanam yena sarvam idam tatam swakarmana tamabhyarcha siddhim vindati manava that's a uh, that's a beautiful shloka in the bhagavad gita chapter 18 by performing one's natural occupation one worships the creator from whom all living entities have come into being and by whom the whole universe is pervaded by such performance of work a person easily attains perfection swakarmana tamabhyarcha siddhim vindati you worship him through your duty through your action whatever action whatever our duties are see we are all maybe university people you're teaching somebody you're working somewhere you are professionals your everyday duty work can become a means to the worship of the divine that is what he's saying you don't have to keep a special time separate for worship or for yoga whatever your everyday work can become worship how does it become worship when you do it with detachment when you do it with the cleanest motive and when you do it as an offering at the feet of the divine so you see people usually set apart time for yoga we do all this but if your action has the the cleanest and the best possible motive you to me become a yoga this is the message he is giving that is why you know karma yoga is a very big philosophy of life i have seen such karma yogis in my life from at least 18 hours a day 18 to 19 hours a day they go on and on with their work not thinking once where, what is this getting me or where am i going with this it's my duty i have to do it my my energy is meant for this and it goes on and on and they never get exhausted this is not the workaholic cat category <laughs> they are doing it not because it's an impulse they can't but do it no they are doing it very consciously they are doing it consciously they are doing it because they believe they are worshiping the supreme through their action and they never get exhausted and people who may who may be setting apart time for meditation and all that many times you know if the mind is not prepared they are, they may not be actually meditating this also happens so always karma yoga is a foolproof philosophy you know if you have the right attitude and you are in karma it will take you very far in the spiritual life and in the evolution of your consciousness so this is beautifully illustrated in this story which vivekananda used to say uh this is the the story of the arrogant yogi and the realized vyad so let me just tell you the story we are going to very serious stuff let's have a story here um this is the story of a young uh, ascetic tapasvi or yogi um who left his uh, parents old parents at home uh left everything and said i want to practice my yoga i don't have time for anything else and went into the forest sat under uh, a tree and for many many months practiced a lot of tapasya yoga he did all this and he did acquire some yogic powers so it so happened that one day one fine day when he was sitting there uh, a crane put some droppings on him and he was angry and he looked up with anger and he burnt up the crane so that much of power he had uh, acquired through his yogic practices now he was very proud he thought oh i'm a real yogi now see i just looked at him and he oh, <laughs> i burnt him up so well everybody should respect me i'm such a big person now i'm a real yogi so he stomped into the neighboring village and he stood with his bowl in front of that's how it used to be in 
uh, Indian villages. He uh, held his bowl in front of the first house and asked for something to eat. Bishan Dehi. The lady of the house, uh, she called him out from within and said, Please wait, sir. Uh, I'll be coming in a few minutes. And she took almost half an hour. And the yogi was very, very angry. Really angry and uh, wanting to teach her a lesson. How dare she make me wait? I'm a yogi. She doesn't know that. I practice so much. I can burn up birds. <laughs> so uh, she came out slowly. And then uh, she said, she looked into his eyes and said, uh, Look, I was serving my husband. That's my primary duty. I was serving my family. And I can only give you uh, food after that. So uh, please don't mind my coming late. And I'm not that crane which you burnt up in the forest. <laughs> you can't do anything to me. And she gave him his arms. And he was so stunned. How did she know I did that in the forest? How did she come to know? So then he, he came to his senses and he said, But how did you know, mother? How did you know I did that in the forest? And she said, I know what is in your mind. And I got, I acquired this power just by serving my family, by my everyday duties to my family, by my commitment to my duties, not through your yoga, not through your tapasya. I did not acquire this by that. And if you want to know more about this, go and learn it from a butcher. And he gave her his address to him. She gave him his address. Learn it from this. Vyad means butcher actually. He has the all the knowledge of karma yoga. Mm. How you can reach the highest just through work, your everyday work. Go and learn it from him. So now the yogi was stunned and shocked at what he saw. And he took the address and went there. And he really met this butcher whose everyday task was to butcher animals. And the yogi had always considered this to be a very, very mean task and uh, one shouldn't be doing it and it's a low grade of work, all this, all these ideas he had in mind. But the butcher gave him such valuable ideas on how, what affects your uh, spiritual consciousness. It is not the type of work you do but the attitude towards the work. So every work is sacred. Every work is holy. And he said, look, the work which I am doing, I have to do it to fend for my family, to support my family. My old parents are there. I have a wife and children. I do it only for that. And I don't think of anything besides that. I do it as an offering at the feet of the divine. So this entire dialogue is called Vyadha Gita. It is another Gita, you know, where he actually teaches him the principles of Karma Yoga, how to work without attachment, without a strong negativity within you, without anger, without too much of possession and greed for the results of the work, how to work without all this, with a very composed, clear state of mind. And he says, this gives me the highest yoga. So, when does karma become yo karma yoga? When it is done with the purest of intentions and motives and without attachment as, as a duty. So, this is what this story is about and Vivekananda was very fond of it. He was a great proponent of karma yoga. Then the Gita gives us wonderful ideas on how to attain harmony within ourselves and around ourselves. Most important thing. So it says, Karma Brahmo Bhavam Vidhi Brahma Akshara Samud Bhavam Tasma Sarvagatam Brahma Nityam Yagne Pratishtitam. The duties for human beings are described in the Vedas and the Vedas are manifested by God Himself. Therefore, the all pervading Lord is eternally present in acts of sacrifice, in acts of yagna. So we will discuss what this means. Now, the, the Vedas, they are constantly talking of these words, yagna, rhythm, and uh, you'll see 
they will say knowledge is based on yajna what does this mean we we require to understand this because it uh, it forms a sizable portion of the bhagavad gita and it is manu- uh, exactly yajna means being able to uh, offer in those days it was uh, the symbolism was offering into fire sacrificial fires but the idea is to be able to offer in all kindness in all sympathy with a good attitude and the very dhatu uh, yaj from which yagnya comes it means actually to give of oneself to be able to do this so this keeps up the cyclic nature of life because life is about interconnectedness isn't it giving exchange a healthy exchange between the individual and the cosmos the individual and the people around the individual so a healthy exchange between these two will bring about yagnya harmony this is described again and again in the bhagavad gita so there actually krishna tells arjun that if you do your duty as a yagnya you fight the war as a yagnya it is a cosmic yagnya you will see you will come in harmony with everything that is good and noble in life you will attain to universal harmony it is done only through yagnya he says it will lead to the highest knowledge don't think it is a massacre of your people don't have such silly ideas because there is no personalized self here you are fighting the war for world peace you're fighting the war, war for harmony and that will naturally come if you have the spirit of yagnya within you so this uh, yagnya and rhythm is again and again actually uh, spoken about in the bhagavad gita and the spirit of yagnya is e- about acknowledging the interconnectedness of life and uh, you know maintaining this healthy exchange between the individual and the cosmos by sharing caring giving what we draw from from life to be able to put back into it to a, to be able to replenish it that is yagnya so the symbolism was you light a fire and keep pouring oblations into it you are making offerings it was symbolic representation of how your life should be it should be an offering it should be a giving for universal life towards universal life so this was the actual symbolism and today actually speaking you know it's so practical this idea that you can even address climate change through the spirit of yagnya i teach this in some of the universities in india uh the idea is this you see any cycle in nature uh, all the biogeochemical cycles you know uh they are being maintained because of a healthy exchange of gases the carbon cycle for example whatever uh, of carbon we take from the atmosphere whatever gets into living bodies or into the oceans has to be returned back to the atmosphere isn't it a renewal should take place uh, or you must be able to replenish what you draw from nature otherwise there's an imbalance and you disrupt the cycle so what happens when you disrupt the cycle carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere and leads to all these climate changes and we know how how tremendous they are they are even melting the arctic caps a oh, huge uh, if you go to the himalayas you will actually see uh, the the level of meltdown and it's a matter for concern for the whole globe so why is this happening only because we have increased a 2022 report says we have increased the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 52% compared to the pre-industrial age and all due to the uh, industrial scale mining of carbon uh, fossil fuels your coal and petroleum and gas and all this and why we are always zooming about wanting to go here and there maybe to no purpose we don't know why but it's the rajas within us which is driving us so you see when we go into things like this we are affecting a global change without inadvertently without knowing it and when we disrupt these biogeochemical cycles it it comes back to us so we have bad air we have pollution at every level and we have the ice caps melting and you have high degree of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so you s- please remember the biosphere is just begging for harmony and balance it will come through the spirit of yagnya because primarily yagnya means 
you what you take from universal life you must be put back you, you must be able to put back into it otherwise don't take don't take it so unless this healthy exchange is there we will disrupt everything in nature and sustainable living will not become possible what okay what is sustainable life we today we are constantly using that word what exactly do we mean by that when we use the word sustainable what it means to say is we are capable of achieving human development goals without disrupting the cycles of nature without compromising on natural resources if we are able to do that it will be sustainable living and not otherwise and without doing that we can't survive on the planet and we have only one planet to survive upon so you see the spirit of yagna should pervade this is repeatedly insisted upon in the bhagavad gita take from life only as much as you can put back there is a everything for people's deed but nothing for our greed and if we are greedy and wanting more and more and too restless to even see the mistakes we are making then well it will disrupt nature beyond repair so you can actually address climate change through the spirit of yagna if the principles of yagna are taught at an early age uh, our generations will be able to handle this very effectively but it requires a lot of you know that's why universities are the most important places where all this should take place these discussions and then it is said in the bhagavad gita that yagna actually leads to divine knowledge how does it do that yagnyarthat karmano nyatra lokoyam karma bandhanah tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sanga samachara work must be done as a yagnya to the supreme lord otherwise work causes bondage in this material world therefore o son of kunti perform your prescribed duties without being attached to the results if you do it as a offering to universal life because you have drawn so much from it See, I always tell my students, for a simple plate of food to come in front of you, how many people have worked for it? Starting from that farmer who sows seeds, fifteen people have worked for it. Have I thanked them when I consumed that food? Do I do anything for them? At least a prayer, at least some way of exchange. it's human life is all about exchange even the very air you're breathing the oxygen you're taking in is given by plants and what did we give back so the idea is this uh, to maintain this healthy exchange we require the spirit of yagna offer and give as much as you can and be prayerful respectful kind grateful in everything and that will bring about the spirit of yagna in whatever we do if we are not grateful we cannot live as good human beings you cannot be happy because life is about exchange no man is an island so this is insisted upon in the bhagavad gita in so many ways you see shreyan dravya maya yagna gnana yagna paranta pa sarvam karma khinam partha gnane parisamapyate O subduer of enemies, sacrifice performed in knowledge is superior to any mechanical material sacrifice. After all, O Partha, all sacrifices of work culminate in knowledge. So you can sacrifice in different ways. You know, in the earliest Vedic yagnas, they used to offer ghee, uh, I mean butter and clarified butter and uh, seeds, teal and all this. It was symbolic. And then uh, you can also. sacrifice in terms of food offering food to someone offering education offering ideas but he says the highest offering is the offering of knowledge and spiritual knowledge that's the highest yagna and it re- leads to divine knowledge so these ideas are there in the bhagavad gita many types of sacrifices are described and then this is told because nahi gnanena sadusham pavitram iha vidyate that swayam yoga samsiddha kalena atmani vindati there is nothing more purifying than knowledge and who realizes this the yoga samsiddha one established in yoga will realize this quickly that it is knowledge that brings about the complete unfoldment of your consciousness uh, you reach the culmination of human evolution through knowledge 
and yajna leads to that knowledge right action performed with the right attitude as a sacrifice to universal life so you keep your accounts clear karma is actual account the bank bank account is just the material <laughs> aspect but the current your karma is your actual account and you keep those accounts clear uh you will attain to the highest knowledge this is the idea then you have the four yagnyas uh, i mean four yogas a uh, beautifully harmonized with the bhagavad gita ye tvaksharam anirdeshyam avyaktam paryupasate sarvatra gamachintyam cha kutastham achalam dhruvam sanni and yanmendre gramam sarvatra samabuddhaya te prapnuvanti mam eva sarvabhuta hiterata which means the personal impersonal both aspects can be approached and worship the path is more difficult for the impersonal but by harmonizing the yogas you can do it see but those who worship the formless aspect of the absolute truth by restraining their senses and being even minded everywhere such persons engage in the welfare of all beings also attain to me the lord says so all these yogas See the outline there have been given as a means to this highest knowledge, the knowledge of the impersonal, Brahman, Brahma Vidya. So you have Raja Yog, Sanni and Yamendriya Gramham. It is in a sense a uh, control of action, speech, and mind. Uh, Raja Yog is actually uh, the science behind yog. You know, how do you convert all of your vital energy into pure consciousness? then you have gnana yog that is the pursuit of the unmanifest through gnana through knowledge avyaktam paryupasate then karma yog uh, the, the equanimity required in all situations and detachment from uh, fruits of action performing action but with detachment that is karma yog then you have bhakti yog which means uh, it is it actually means the love of god and service of all human beings as because god resides in all human beings so all these yogas are described in the bhagavad gita and there's a harmony between these yogas see if you go into the uh, religious history of india many philosophies were at loggerheads with each other many the dvaita philosophy would not admit of advaita dvaita would not admit of dvaita or vishishta dvaita so all this was there but in the bhagavad gita you will find a harmony of everything all the different systems of philosophy all the different yogas and everything has been described together as means to the ultimate so this is the beauty of uh, bhagavad gita then as i told you you have enormous messages of for mind management see how beautifully it is described the root of all problems is described like this in the bhagavad gita dhyayato vishayan pumsak sanghaste shopajayate sanghat sanjayate kama kama krodho bi jayate it doesn't end there krodhat bhavati sammoha sammoha smriti vibhramah smriti bhramshat buddhi nasho buddhi nashat pranashyate what it means to say is while contemplating on the objects of the senses one develops attachment towards them from attachment comes anger because all uh, all your desires are not going to be satisfied so it gives rise to anger um sangha stesha sangha sanjayate kama from desire the from desire comes anger from anger comes mm, krodhat bhavati sammoha delusion from delusion comes smriti bhramsha that is the destruction of memory and from the destruction of memory when you don't know what is the right thing to do in any particular situation comes the all destructive force of ignorance which means you will do the wrong action and fall into dire consequences so the entire uh, thing has been outlined the sequence of events leading to uh, wrong action bad action and uh, the consequences of downfall so this is uh, 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 an important sequence in the bhagavad gita how the human mind behaves uh, when it has strong desire and attachment and when when it concentrates on merely the sense objects of life then uh, also you can control the whole situation this is also described hmm? so is the remote in your hand krishna says it is 
ಹಿಸೇಸ್ ಉದ್ಧರೇತ್ ಆತ್ಮನ ಆತ್ಮಾನಂ ನ ಆತ್ಮಾನಂ ಅವಸಾದೈತ್ ಆತ್ಮೈವ ಆತ್ಮನೋ ಬಂಧು ಆತ್ಮೈವ ರಿಪುರಾತ್ಮನ ವಿಚ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರೇಸ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬೈ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಹೌ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡಿನೌನ್ಸ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬೈ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬೈ ದ ರಾಂಗ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆತ್ಮೈವ ಆತ್ಮನೋ ಬಂಧು ಯು ಯು ಆರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಓನ್ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ ಆರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಓನ್ ವರ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಎನಿಮಿ ಡಿಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಹೌ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟ್ರೈನ್ಡ್ ಯುವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ and the means to the training of the mind also has been outlined abhyasena to kaunteya vaira kirna chakrihete by practice and detachment you can train your mind towards making the right decisions the right actions because arjuna tells him tells krishna at one point that it is mano durnigraham chalam it is very difficult to uh, stop this mind and control it it's like the wind and i can't control it and krishna says it is difficult but it is not impossible you can do it through practice and through detachment so such ideas uh, you will find how the mind can be disciplined and made turned inward then the divine and the demonic in man are also described in the bhagavad gita in i have put a few verses there abhayam sattva samshuddhi gnana yoga vyavasthitihi danam damasya yajnascha swadhyaya stapajanam see the main qualities of uh, the divine in man are fearlessness purity of mind steadfastness in spiritual knowledge charity control of the senses sacrifice study of sacred books austerity and straightforwardness non violence truthfulness absence of anger renunciation peacefulness restraint from fault finding compassion towards all living beings absence of covetousness gentleness modesty and lack of fickleness vigor forgiveness fortitude cleanliness bearing enmity towards none and absence of vanity so these are the qualities which we consider divine and they can be cultivated in man the demonic is also uh, described uh, qualities of hypocrisy ar- arrogance conceit anger harshness and ignorance and whatever you feed will grow within you if you feed the divine the divine will grow So the fulfillment of life is finally described in the last slide as a life lived in self knowledge with complete awareness coming into full bloom within your system and it's supposed to be the highest joy the human mind can experience yam labdhwa cha param labham manyate nadhikam tatah yasmin sthito na dukhena guru na api vichalyate having gained that state one does not consider any attainment to be greater being thus established one is not shaken even in the midst of the greatest calamity see what a huge gain it would be if this was possible in our lives ah where you have uh, just not the synthetic joy of life you know but original happiness blooming right from within you all the time and you remain equanimous in all situations and never get derailed with negativities in your life so this is a possibility this is the actual uh, sthita pragnya avastha which uh, uh, lord krishna describes the man of uh, equanimous intelligence and vision uh, where his mind always is imbued with deep awareness and great calmness and control being able to make the right decisions full of awareness and joy by itself and always doing the right thing this is a possibility in human life and this is described as the goal of all human striving 